one driving thought all my life has been that of um, computer communication for use in developing countries. Uh, you know, I did a PhD in India and uh, came to the United States in 1971. Uh, I spent two years there at the Carnegie Mellon University and returned. And during those two years, they were exciting years of the ARPANET. I personally was uh, working in the area of artificial intelligence and its use in education. Uh, there was always a concern for things which were value of value in national development, the kind of thing that leads to socio-economic development in a nation, and education was one of them. And uh, then I realized when I first ran into the ARPANET, here was a new technology which was going to be very important to developing countries as a whole, including, of course, India. And... Uh, which was at a much earlier stage of development at that time. Uh, and I was excited by that thought and that drove me to spend the next 15 years of my life working on um, computer network technologies, including the internet technologies. And uh, it is what happened in those 15 years that were particularly significant in what's happening here now. The breakthrough moments were uh, the moments where uh, the moments when you succeed in establishing communication. To uh, a person in our field, it's a bit like the moment when uh, Marconi tries to establish communication over the Atlantic, and you are personally reenacting it in your own life, doing it in a different context using a technology. And, uh, of course, we had the benefit of others who had done something similar before. But all the same, when you connect up across the continent suddenly from where you are, and boom, here is a connection. And that is a moment of uh, great excitement. And that moment came to me in 1988, when we connected uh, the... Uh, computers in our lab with uh, computers in Amsterdam at uh, what is called the CWRI, Centre Viscunde Informatic. Uh, CWRI was, uh, uh, CWI if I remember right, uh, CWI was uh, the internet gateway which allowed us to connect up and uh, so we connected up using a very primitive technology and uh, we succeeded there. If I remember right, that moment was uh, using good old telephone dial-up and uh, running a variety of, oh, no, it was not telephone dial-up. It was X.25 connection, which was a dial-up X.25. We dialed into a network in Bombay and uh, which connected us to the X.25 network of the world, which was the approved network that the government telecom agencies would allow to use in those days. They considered the internet protocols of today as not being international protocols at that time. There had been exciting moments of uh, what you might call protocol warfare and every country trying to push its own set of protocols. And uh, we were allowed X.25, so we came in on X.25 into Amsterdam and then ran an internet protocol, TCP, on top of that. It's a peculiar combination of running TCP over X.25, which was technically known as a possibility, but rarely anyone bothered to use it. But we used it, and we made a connection. But that was just the beginning. And after that, soon we were running, um, whether it was perfectly legal or not, I don't know. But we were running TCP IP over a dial-up line to the United States. And then we were uh, formally allowed to have a leased line and run TCP IP on it. These were all exciting moments. The moments when we established connection to the world. And the moment of connection to the US was when we connected up to Falls Church in Virginia 
where there was this pioneering institution called the UUNet. If I remember right, it was a company. And we connected up with the UUNet. And uh, for a couple of years, we depended on their network connection for maybe more than a couple of years. And it was, uh, these were exciting days. That's an interesting question, but let me turn it around. Okay. If you look out there, would you say it is uh, cloudy and uh, uh, bit cold for a person coming from a warm country? Or would you say it's a great day for a walk? Uh, I don't know. To a large extent, I think it depends not on the weather, but it depends upon you, what you feel inside. And uh, therefore, looking at uh, the internet, there are great bright things to be seen. There are worries and uh, concerns you could have. You, both are possible. I am personally of the type who gets excited by looking at positive things of life, looking at the silver lining rather than at the cloud. And um, so I would say there are, uh, I have great hopes for the internet. I think the internet is the culmination of all that the universities have been doing for universities of the whole world have been doing for 600 years or more. And the modern universities as we talk about them, with the dealing with the kind of modern knowledge as we talk about knowledge, uh, not theological knowledge, but knowledge of, uh, I, I don't know, I don't want to characterize it too much at the moment, but talking about knowledge that uh, leads to science and technology. And I think the internet is a great step forward in that spirit of sharing of knowledge and uh, creating, opening communication channels all over and uh, sharing services and sharing knowledge. These are the great things uh, in the human life that the internet has made possible. So I am all excited about this. I think I am a little concerned about the invasion of privacy. Um, anyone who accesses the internet quickly can find out more about me than what my mother knows about me <laughs> or my wife knows about me, <laughs> right? And uh, my bank depends upon me uh, to remember my mother's maiden name. And if I can speak it out on the phone, oh, it's authenticated. Obviously, it's Ramani, and he knows his mother's maiden name, and nobody else knows. It's just nonsense, because you get to the internet, he knows everybody's mother's maiden name. And so I think the uh, loss of privacy, I think, is a concern. It doesn't hurt as long as there are no pathological elements around. And if you're fortunate enough to avoid the pathological elements, you're all right. And, uh, but we should not rule out the possibility of uh, people misusing uh, the uh, openness that has been encouraged in the world, partly by the excitement of sharing information about each other and maintaining our college days continuously to maintain that camaraderie and com uh, create that community feeling, but partly also commercially. There are people who promote your declaring everything about you. My birthday. What concern is it of anybody in the world what my birthday is? Maybe it is of importance to 50 people. And I tell them, and they know it. Why should I put it out on the internet? But every website tells me I have to give them my birthday. And so I think privacy is a bit irritating, uh, the lack of privacy. I think it's a professional issue for many people to research and do something about. Second is security. The world's electronic commerce seems to largely depend upon a few simple technologies. For example, let me mention, there is a public key interchange, which is the mechanism which kicks in when you call your bank on the internet. And it runs on a protocol which uh, it uses a mechanism, a cryptographic mechanism, f 
there is no mathematical proof to say it is unbreakable. And it's been tried and tested and they make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And they think it's safer and safer and safer. If some damn fool builds a quantum computer tomorrow and breaks through the PKI, I don't know what will happen to the world's uh, electronic commerce. The day your bank account and my bank account vanish, <laughs> and what happens to people? <laughs> Even if 1% of the money in the banks gets mishandled, there will be an economic collapse uh, in civilization as we have never known. So I think it's a theoretical issue for a computer professor who reads about such things. It's not everybody is concerned. It may not be very important. I do not know. But to a computer science professor, it looks like a challenge. Why can't we have provable protocols to ensure security of communication? But that's more of your academic interest as a professor rather than other concerns. I think socially there is a third concern, a very peculiar new concern of mine. I've been excited about the uh, astronomers uh, who go and look at faraway stars and identify planets like the Earth uh, around. Found thousands of them. None of them seems to. There is no sign there is any habitable climate there. And there is no sign there is anything like a, an intelligent being out there. So are we alone in the world, in the universe? Are we very unique? And what do we have? We are just not well evolved animals. We also uh, happen to be having an unbelievable community a way of social life. We have built up a society. We have a method of sharing knowledge. And we have created a hell of a lot of knowledge in the last 20,000 years. If all this disappears one day, due to some astronomical stupid thing like a huge big asteroid coming our way or a comet or some such ridiculous thing, what happens to all this? And suddenly I find there is something to worry about. And there is something very important to care about. It's not my life, it's not your life, it's not anyone else's life alone. It is the continuity of human life. It is the continuity of human society and continuity of human knowledge. And we have to recognize how rare it is. And we have to give it to the astronomers to have discovered it's extremely rare. It's an unbelievable thing. It, it's too complicated and too beautiful to arise out of accident. It is something remarkable. And I hope the internet will play a role in preserving human knowledge and uh, making it very invulnerable to any form of catastrophe on Earth. Maybe we'll mess up the Earth by our what we do to the uh, climate, maybe uh, some astronomical phenomena will wipe us out, whatever. But I think uh, internet is a hope that there will be somebody someday out there having access to this knowledge that has been created and to the ways of life that we have created. I think we have to look back 600 years ago uh, you know, uh, in particular, I'm very excited about things that I've read about and seen picturizations of. Remarkable moments when an English uh, student traveled all the way to University of Padua, uh, somewhere in the 1400s, the end of the 1400s, the beautiful period of Renaissance. And uh, they were doing crazy things in uh, Padua. Uh, cutting up dead bodies and things like that, which was prohibited. And uh, doing research. And this guy wanted to go and do that kind of research. It surely was not possible in where he lived. And he traveled all the way, went to internationally to another university and studied there. And he discovered, he was supposed to have discovered the nature of blood pressure. But in reality, what he discovered was that heart is a pump. And he explained how it works, physiology, and uh, the physiology of the heart. Out of that came brilliant knowledge. And uh, 
this knowledge was not preserved very carefully by the university to get some patents and a bit more money and a few million dollars more. It was shared. It was given to some stranger from far away and he was educated and he, this knowledge was shared with him. And uh, I think that is what a university is all about. Where the biggest reward a professor gets is that if he discovers and discloses information about a new disease, he, it is named after him. It is Addison's disease. It is not somebody else's disease. <laughs> he gets his name attached to the disease. This is the great credit he gets. So he runs and tells the world about the disease. And uh, this is what the universities are about. And this is what we have been doing. And uh, the internet, to some extent, exemplifies the kind of spirit. When the US government put money into developing communication capability on the Unix operating system, uh, there was a version of Unix that was uh, given away to the world, BSD Unix. And uh, I think it's called Berkeley Systems Distribution or something like that, BSD Unix. And this willingness to share new technology, to share new knowledge, and uh, not to say, you know, I'll lock up the protocol. I'll make sure I'll make money on it. And uh, we spend government money, but the government money is, should go to everyone. And not just every American, not every US citizen, but it's available to anyone in the world. I think I remember paying $110 or $75 or some such princely sum of money to get a copy of BSD Unix on a big tape. And the day we got it, we were so excited. Put it on our machine and it ran. And this was great fun. I think we have to preserve these values of uh, creating new knowledge and sharing new knowledge internationally and uh, making sure it goes to benefit everyone. I think in the process, we just don't make somebody else rich. We make everyone else rich. Everyone rich. And I think from this is very important.